G'day everyone, my name is Tom Craig and you're listening to my podcast, The Help Side, where we speak to some of the most recognisable names in world hockey and get an insight into who they are, what they're about and what makes them tick. Now if you like what you hear, feel free to follow our socials at The Help Side on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook and be sure to like and subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss an episode. We'd absolutely love that. Our guest this week is former Kookaburra and ex-Kookaburra assistant coach, Nathan Eglinton. Eggy, as he's known, has an incredibly unique story built on equal parts success and hardship. Before being forced into retirement at just 27, after suffering a horrific injury on the training pitch, Egg amassed 140 games, 50 goals, and an Olympic gold medal. Known as one of the most damaging ball runners to ever play for the Kookaburras, Eggy was truly a sight to behold as he charged with the midfield with a head of speed, and his four-stick drag was the stuff of legend. But, as Eggy will tell you, what he achieved on the hockey pitch takes rather a back seat compared to some of the things he's overcome and managed throughout his life. And as I listen back to our interview, it's difficult not to get emotional as he tells his story. Over the next two episodes, Egg takes us on a journey, from the pain of losing his mother in childhood to the Athens gold, Olympic Village shenanigans, being a Guinness World Record holder, and life as a father to a very special family. Egg interweaves some absolutely cracking stories into his yarn that had me in stitches. And by the end, I'm sure you'll agree that this one has everything. That's enough for me. Please enjoy the help side of Nathan Eglinton. Sitting here with Nathan Eglinton, who got up to get a drink of water before, and I, I spied maybe wearing some board shorts in the sunny yep. tweed. Is that correct? Yeah, got some uh, board shorts on there. Blue pineapple <laughs> numbers. Um, very, very tropical. Blessed, blessed with the uh, the beautiful Tweed Coast weather, mate. Even our winter's been um, dreadful. It's uh, been very sunny. Really? No rain? Yeah, yeah it's been... Uh, we've had a little bit, but I constantly say that we're spoilt with the with the uh, winter weather here, so it's, um, it's a delight. I have to say, climactically, or climatically, I'm not sure, someone can correct me, it's probably my favourite place in the world. Just nothing, nothing seems to go wrong on the tweet. No, it's, yeah, we're, we're very lucky here. It's, it was a little hidden away sort of gem of a place 20, 25 years ago, but then the rest of the world found out and we're at a place now that it's one of the more, I guess, prestige holiday spots in, in the entire east coast of Australia, I think. So. Mm. Well, we're going we're gonna to rewind to there, maybe not 25 years ago, but maybe 39 years ago or so. Yep. You're born in Mul- <laughs> you're born in Moolumba. <laughs> Like most, yep. like many Australian hockey players, actually, that is incredible how so many incredibly talented hockey athletes come from Moolumba. What's what's that about? Yeah, so so I was born Moolumba Hospital. Um, yeah, thirty nine and however many months. I'm forty in a couple of months. So thirty nine years ago, uh, born in Moolumba Hospital, um, and then grew up grew up in the red dirt of Coogeon, which is a small town that just sits on the back of of Kingscliff, um, just away from the beach. You can still see the water from Coogeon. Um, that's how close you are. But it, it's funny, it goes from prestige beach coast living into prime ag- agricultural farming land, which is like rich red soil. Um, it's very well known in this area for what it can produce. Um, so I grew up there in the dirt and then eventually made my way in, into Kingscliff. But you're right, the Tweed, for a small association sort of town, we've had a rich history of producing good hockey players. Um, men and women, we've got a, we've got a good number of senior Australian representatives, junior Australian representatives, lots of masters representatives still carry on into the into the twilight years, I guess if you want to call them that in um, in playing. And so it's it's an association that is rich with with history. The old the old Bullumbar days. I remember growing up as a kid was just eight fields going at once, packed like fields of families and and kids running around from their under eleven days at 9am with their shinies on at 3.30 in the Arvo still. Like th- those pictures are still pretty, pretty clear in my mind. I just refuse to believe that there are these pockets in, um, in Australia of towns like Rockhampton is one. The Tweed <clears throat> yeah. is definitely another. I don't yeah. believe that it's just chance that so many great hockey players come out of these places. What do you think it is? Um, well, I, I guess me growing up in my, as, as a kid, Lots of people were very invested in the sport. Um, like I'm probably one of thousands that 
were born, you know, come weeping out of the womb with a hockey stick in my hand. <laughs> if you'd like to, if you'd like to put it in that sense, that that people are just born into the sport, and so immediately you've got good people around you who love who love the game. Lots of people back in those days were willing to volunteer. You know, give up their time for nothing. It's a little bit harder these days to get to get a bulk of people to do that. But we also had people who were at a level that could, I guess, guide people if they were ever had, a, had an aspiration to, to be a better hockey player. You had good coaching. Like Brian Fitzpatrick was the, my first ever real, you know, individualised coach. And I know you know him. He's, wor- he's working with the Kookaburras and that now. He's been around the game forever, so it seems. And I remember as a young kid, I used to go down and watch... I watched, I trained and I used to watch him train Neville Newell. He was like one of the, the guns here from Tweed, played in like the inaugural sort of NHL years back in the early 90s for the Brisbane Blades, they were called back then. And so um, he he was willing to give me a chance as a kid to try and try and be better. And I was a little kid at the time and, and maybe through my teenage years probably didn't didn't get to a state team or anything like that, that I probably wanted to, but it wasn't something that I, I, I got disappointed at. Mm. Um, but, but I'm, I'm probably one of a handful that have gone through that same sort of system where there's such good people around the tweed that can harness something that they see in talent and get some good coaches around them and give them a chance. And we're, and tweed were always healthy in numbers going away to state championships and things like that. They had, huge numbers in boys and girls back in the day. And, and so you had a platform to give yourself a chance to try and make a team if you wanted to, I think. Mm. So what did that far North New South Wales coastal living look like as a kid? Were there other sports involved? Um, well, growing up when I was a young boy, I, I played hockey and then I played um, cricket, um, played for Coogeon Cricket Club, started as a beginner. They caught like a bit like the Mickey Mods, played as a beginner and then went through 11s, I think it was 11s, and then it changed to 12s, 14s, and then into some senior cricket. Um, but hockey was always the one that I wanted to play, mm. um, being the family sport. My grandfather, he's 92 now, he founded our hockey club. Oh, wow. So moved down from Kingscl- uh, from Brisbane, they moved to Kingscliff, and then had um, a, a conversation with some mates in a, in a, in a hall or something, I, I believe is the story. And we're going to start the Kingsley hockey club. And then the rest is history. It's 50, what was it? It was 50, it's 58 years. I think this year or something like that. Unbelievable. that this, this, cl- this club has been around and we've got an extension of family that has been through it, but there's other big families like the Pritchard family and other families who have come through our club who have been mainstays forever, you know, and, and that builds, I guess, the sort of town relationship, a community feel that it's still, it's the heartbeat still going today, which is pretty incredible. Yeah. Okay. So it was a real kind of family down at the hockey club. You'd be there all day. Um, you'd watch your grandpa. Did your grandpa still play while you were, while you were no, playing? No, no, he wasn't playing, but I had a mum played, my auntie played, my three uncles all played in the senior team. Um, <laughs> And so I think I played juniors in the morning and I was ball boying, running the line with the ball um, in the senior games, probably still with my shinies on, you know, that, that sort of look. So you're down there all day and then falling asleep either at the leagues club for dinner or in the car and you'd wake up in the morning in your bed and wonder how you got there, you know, that, that type of scenario, which is, I guess it's every kid's dream. You go all day and your battery runs out and then you wake up in your bed and you go, well, how did I get here? <laughs> Yeah, that's so, brilliant. Yeah. At what stage did you um did it stop becoming like a family thing and and start becoming something that you wanted to take a little bit more seriously? Did you ever have aspirations to play for Australia, or was it just fun? Well, I don't know if I had aspirations to play for Australia, but I was I was a real I was a real student of not not the finer details of the game, but I just love watching it. Like mm. my nan and pop had they had like cupboards full of tapes, like. 88 Olympics on tape, 92 Olympics on tape. And as I grew up as a teenager, 96 Olympics on tape, some World Cups and Champions Trophies. And I used to just sit there and watch that stuff, <laughs> like re- religiously. And I still, I still like being able to like go, oh, I remember the 96 Olympic team because I watched it that many times and I could name it, you know. Like, and 
I don't think it was an obsession, but I just loved playing. I was playing in the in the front yard, things like that, trying to get my mates to play. I didn't play hockey. They'd come around for a hit and I'd go, oh, this sport's dangerous. They're all footy players. They're thinking the game's dangerous. Um, but also had an extended family, like cousins that played through Kingscliff as a junior. And, and it was, yeah, you know, I was... I don't know if I had that aspiration to say when I was a young kid, I wanted to play for Australia. I think I, think I made my first New South Wales PWSA team, like the primary schools team. Um, and I think at the time in, in the paper with my photo in the little interview, I said I wanted to be the next Stephen Davies. And I, st- I still remind, I used to remind him about that story a little bit when I was living in Perth. It wasn't a bad model to look up to, although at the time he did have the long hair and the bandana. So he was a bit rock star. Mm. That's very cool, actually, because a lot of kids going through when I when I was growing up, um, I mean, I knew a few names probably only because of the the gold medal. Um, I mean, I was nine when that happened. Not really thinking about playing for Australia at that stage, but yeah, it's a pretty, um, it's a it's a nice. Well, the fact that you could see all those teams that had gone before, um, that's kind yeah. of a great culture. I would I would kill to be able to watch the eighty eight and ninety two and ninety six. Yeah. Games. I haven't seen a minute of footage from any of those. I would love to. Wow, you should do yourself a favour because I, I look at those games and then, like, I fast forward. I would fast forward now, like, into my adult years and living in Perth. That, like, I was I was hanging out with these people. Like, they'd become because I'd become part of that hockey community. Mm. Like, I was rubbing shoulders and mucking around with Stephen Davies. These got these types of players, and and even like the Lee Bottomeads and that, who I ended up coming when I come through the AHL years in my early years he was one of the like sort of you know guiding figures in our team and he, he was an Olympian and, and a, one of Queensland's greatest and Australia's mm. greatest and mm. I used to watch him on the tapes these guys and then <laughs> you end up you end up you end up playing with them and when I'm 14 watching them on the TV never never in your mind do you think oh one day I'm going to be beside them mucking around and training and playing with them you just look at them as these Australian hockey players and, and what they could do that was me sitting on the carpet watching these tapes and no matter how many times I watched them, the results never changed. <laughs> so sometimes you'd watch some games that we may not have won and you go, well, this is about the 187th time I've watched this. I wonder, I wonder if we'll actually get this corner or not. No, no, we didn't get it. Were there any, were there any moves that you saw and, and you practiced in your own time? Um, well, not until, not until I would sort of got into my teenage years, I think. Mm. Like, if I think about Australian hockey players who I watched and, and liked, like, in the end, I just idolised Michael Brennan. Mm. Like, the, when I watched him play, he was this just this player that had this little bit of intimidation about him, but he, the way he played and the way he carried the ball was just something that I just looked at and go, that is the type of ball runner I want to be. And so I just tried to model my game on him, you know, in the end, like once I got into a position where I could play, I developed exactly the same drag as him mm. because I used to watch him religiously mm. and I used to practice it and practice it and practice it. And he just had this four stick drag that was just untouchable. And he could do it. So he could do it at, at, at fast net speed and the drag was, I used to watch it and go, I want to be able to do that because he was just this incredible hockey player. And then, mm. Sure enough, he was one of those guys that as we come through the, the National League program, as I come through um, with that crop of Queenslanders, those young Queenslanders, and he was one of those guys that all of a sudden, oh, my God, like this guy is leading our team. Like the guy I'm idolising, I'm now at training, scared I'm not, I don't want to make a mistake. I don't really want to talk to him. I just want to be him. I just want to be him. <laughs> is it that obvious? I'm just trying to, like, I just want to be you. <laughs> That's brilliant. So... Yeah. Yeah, go on. Yeah, and so like it's if there was anyone I looked at and go, I want to practice the moves. In the end, it was that that was the type of player I wanted to be. Yeah, okay. And in the end, you definitely you're pretty renowned for your your four stick drag, but also yeah, I, I, was I got there in the end. Well, I was talking to Mick McCann as well. The the left foot just popping it, just attacking the defender's left foot is another one yeah. that's very very trademark. And I'm not sure yeah. if you developed that one yourself, but that's a goodie. Um, no, I don't, I don't know. It's a goodie. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Oh, yeah, oh, it's a good one. Yeah, it's I'm the trying best. To work out it. It's the best. <laughs> um, 
I want to talk about, I want to pick up on something that, that you said before. You said you played for the New South Wales PWSA team and that's something that you actually don't have a choice in. Um, for those of you no. who don't know how it works, you, where you go to school is who you represent. But the rest of the time you talk about being a, a proud Queenslander. Um, yep. And it's a bit confusing really because obviously you grew yep. up in New South Wales, but like a lot of mm. far north coast New South Welshmen, you, you elect to play for Queensland early on and stick with it. And I have yep. to say was a pretty good call at that stage because you ended up winning, what, five AHLs in the space of six mm. years, something like that. It's ridiculous. Yeah, so How's that the, work? the way it works, so the way it works is logistically, yes, we're a, we're a New South Wales town or our, our region. The Tweed, the Tweed Coast and Tweed Valley is, is northern New South Wales, but our association is affiliated with Queensland. It used to be called Tweed Border. It used to be Tweed Border um, and then over the years, then it was border or bit then tweed border and, and now it's hockey tweed and it's had some evolution along the way, but our association is affiliated with Queensland. So when you represent tweed, you would go into Queensland. And so mm. you would play a Coulter shield when you, there used to be a thing called Coulter shield. They still have it now. Um, so 11s, 13s, 15s, and right through to seniors, you used to play a Calder Shield, which was a Southeast Queensland style competition because you had so many associations nearby. You had Tweed, Gold Coast, Brisbane, excuse me, Warwick, Ipswich, Toowoomba. And you'd play these competitions, um, which was almost like a mini state championships because you played these comps, you'd play away, home, away, home. And then you also got the state championships as well, where you would go to, we went under 13s. I think we went to Gladstone. Yep. Um, and played on on the grass there, and every association from every corner of Queensland, like Atherton Tablelands and Mount Isa's, and you name it, they're sending teams, and it was this <laughs> massive carnival atmosphere, and and that was how, that's how, and when you said a choice, when I you choose to play, or you don't get a choice for schools, it's a little bit similar with the association. You sure. you choose to live here, and this is the association, so you go to Queensland. Gotcha. Um, and then that's where your state teams got picked from the state championships. You'd go there and they'd have these group of selectors walk around with the clipboards. You knew who they were and <laughs> you'd be in your divisions and you'd play in your pools and then you'd get shifted, right? You'd finished in top two. You'd go this way and other teams would go that way. And um, you'd try and make the best of wherever you fell in what division to see if you could have a chance of winning um, the state championship. And Br- Brisbane were always the team to beat. They're, they're the metropolitan city. They had the, the biggest number of cattle to pick from mm. but i remember that under 13 year actually in gladstone 93 we went all the way um all the way to top four tweet like townsville and brisbane were usually the mainstay types um rockhampton always were in the year above me because they had jamie dwyer and he would take 16 yard hits and next minute he's hitting it in the goal that's that's <laughs> the type of game rockhampton played they had liam munro was another good state hockey player that come from out of rockhampton and he was he was almost like He's Scotty Pippen to Jordan, gotcha. that type of relationship. But yeah, he was he was he was a year above me, so I always had one one year in my own catchment of age where we didn't have to worry about Jamie. Which was <laughs> a good thing. <laughs> you remember um, your first yeah, state so, team? Uh, yeah, it was under under thirteens. Um, I actually played, and it, it, it leads into the, to this story nicely. That after I played PWSA, I played my first under 13 state team, I actually played for New South Wales. Mm, oh boy. Yeah. And so I played one year of under 13s, we went to Melbourne and played against Jamie's um, age group. And the next year played for Tweed, went to Queensland, made the 13s um, state team um, and went away and we won. Um, I think I played a tournament at that, at that event hey. as well. Under 30. But then, and then that, this is where the story gets interesting because I was a small kid and then from that point on, I didn't have the, the typical pathway of, okay, you've been identified, right, you'll make this. Like these days, the opportunities are there for kids to, to be in, in a system and constantly be sort of seen or recognised and, and monitored because you have these trials and they send two state teams away in the junior years now, some of the the states and so there's a bigger opportunity to stay involved I, I i was a little kid as a 14 and 15 year old and and again i probably didn't have that oh, i really want to do this or really want to do that um and I, I didn't make another state team until my last year of under 18s wow so i 
was going away and playing in the state championships and things like that. But yeah, I, ne- I never actually got into a, um, a Queensland state team until I was in my last year. Hmm. And I was around that time, sort of 17-ish, 16 into 17. I sort of had a growth spurt and got a bit taller and a bit quicker and could probably compete, as you know, and a lot of people understand is that that 15 to 18 sort of jump is can be quite difficult for some kids that, that don't grow. And so you get these kids that have these big growth spurts and you rock up and they're almost like little adults mm. um, playing against kids. Um, mm. And I, I, I may have been one of those that that didn't get that, that growth spurt when I needed it. And also I, I may not have deserved it. I can't, can't quite remember. I, I, I may not have been good enough in, in, that, in that sort of period to, to make a team. Mm. Um, and then, then that had that break and then under 18s that last year I was, I was selected. Mm. And it's a, it's a short hop between being selected for <laughs> your second Queensland team. Three years later, I think you debuted for the Kookaburras. Yeah. Is that right? <clears throat> So, uh, yeah, it was, I think, 98, I made that Queensland under-18 team. And in the space of the next 12 months, I'd played 18s, 21s and National League, or pretty much one after the other. And that was 98. And then the end of 2000, I was selected to go to Perth. And so, not much time to blink and breathe. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, I was sort of just ro- ro- sort of riding this little, you know, um, roller coaster of okay well i've been identified and i've been selected in the state team next minute i'm in a under 18 sort of national group we went to a camp in canberra and then i was playing 21s and then we went through and um play i played those three years and then by the end of that those three 21s that's when i was i was in perth um for that last that last year 2001 Mm. um and then that was at the same time i was into the senior um senior squad Mm. and so it was and I'm living proof that you can, you don't have to be the stereotypical pathway athlete to still get an opportunity. And Michael Mick McCann's another, you know, he was a late bloomer. And there, there's, there's plenty of opportunity there if you get the timing right and you're willing to, you know, put your hand in the fire and see, see how it goes because you, you never know your luck. Um, you got to make your own luck, but you got to, you got to give yourself a chance. And I was selected and then, was also pretty fortunate that I come through with a pretty decent crop of Queenslanders at the same time. Mm. We had, we had a huge, we had a huge crop that eventually would go on into the national program that were all about 12 months apart. There was Jamie, there was myself, you know, there was Rob Hammond, there was Liam DeYoung, Stephen Lambert. We all come through at the same time and come through the 21 system together rolled into the national league system at the same time, but also then had the luxury of that, this young energetic group had Michael Brennan, Troy Elder, Dean Butler. Even when I first come in, we had Murray Richards, who was an Australian rep. We had these already like semi-established national players sitting above this enthusiastic, ambitious, happy go lucky type of group. And it just gelled together beautifully for not only team success, but it allowed, I guess, a platform for individuals to show what they could do because you're part of a good team, Mm. you know, like, and that's something you never take for granted that some people can go an entire senior national league career and not win one. Mm. You know, I I was part of Queensland's first (laughs) AHL title. Didn't wow. come until 2003. Wow. Like I, I remember when I first come in, 99, we got beaten in the semi or final maybe. Final actually by WA in WA. 2000, we didn't make, we made the semis, got knocked out, played third and fourth. 2001, 2002, we lost the final to WA and then 2003 was when we broke through. Um, and so we'd been around the mark with this young group, but it had sort of taken its taken a little bit of time to, to get that team to a point where we knew how to win. I think um, mm. we always had the ability, but like, like with a lot of top level sports in the pressure moments, you've you got to know how to, to actually get it done. Mm. And talent will probably only get you so far. Um, but 
yeah, in that in that period, we I won a couple of twenty ones as well in there, and then international into that national league in twenty three, uh, two thousand three, I was twenty two, and we we won our first one, and then went on that little run through the two thousands um, where we had some amazing success. Yeah, I want to talk about your transition to Perth, and it sounds like you were fortunate because that that group probably all moved to Perth around the same time, and you you would have had each other to yep. to lean on. But just before we get to that. I noticed you have a you have a tattoo on your on your bicep of I, I believe it's your your mum's name. Yep. Um, yeah. And and you lost your mum when you were when you were quite young. Can you just yeah. talk to us a little bit about that and and how that yeah. was for you? So I was I was eleven, turning eleven, um, and like it's been almost thirty years, mm. and it's not it's not something that's easy. Mm. Um, but I'm I'm happy to talk about it because, like, any any physical reaction that I have, like, is like a reminder that it's real, you know. Mm. Um, but so she passed away from an aneurysm, and at the time, like, <clears throat> my mum had remarried, and my stepdad he was a working chef, business owning, like, successful businessman and a working chef. And there was my older sister who was sort of 12, 13. And then my younger sisters, Rhiannon and, and T- Tegan, the youngest, she was, she was only like a baby, mm. like very young. Mm. Um, and at the time, like in the end, I ended up going, my older sister and um, myself went and lived with my nan and pop because dad, dad was still working had the two young girls um, and so with the support around and from family, we were able to sort of get ourselves by. But at the time, you don't realise, and it's only, it's only now that I'm a grown adult that I understand that, like, my nan and pop were retired, mm. you know, retired, like, hardly any money, took my sister in. And, th- and I think at some point, and me and my uncle, my mum's um, brother and that, and my auntie's, um, whenever we go around. So we joke about it at times that I think every, nearly every single family member at some point has lived at Nana Pops <laughs> because of a house being built or something going on. And, and back in the day, the Kindy Street house, which was a double story house, was just this almost like a halfway house for people just to sort of, oh, we're, we're living here for, for a bit now. Like, um, and so, and at the time, like, like I admit, that in my early teenage years, and I probably didn't realise this until I was older, I was probably pretty lost. Mm. Like, like really, and I, I was not that I was a bad kid, like no way, but like just maybe no real direction. Mm. Sort of just floating and, and, and not really understanding the sacrifices that my grandparents made to take us on. And, and we'll talk about it maybe a bit later about what they then did about traveling around with me when I become like a, a, a senior player for the national team. But I probably didn't really, it probably doesn't really hit you about the, the significance of losing a parent until you have your own kids. Mm. Do you remember when you, yeah. when you were called up to, to make that Australian team? Um, how did that feel? And, and did you tell Nan and Pop straight away? Yeah, I, well, we just finished the Junior World Cup. And we didn't get the result, obviously, that we would wanted to. Um, we had a Junior World Cup 2001. It was in Hobart. And we had, um, I think we finished fifth or something. And it was after that Junior World Cup that I was, because I'd come over to Perth on the old AIS scholarships. That's what they were. And you had the scholarship period. And I was at a bit of a crossroad because I'd only been in Perth for a year. And I was like, mm. well, am I going to stay here? What am I going to do? Am I, I going to go home? And I remember... It was around, it was just after the Junior World Cup, they'd gone, they went to a Champions Trophy in maybe Rotterdam or somewhere like that in Holland. Liam DeYoung got called up out of the Junior World Cup. He went. Um, <clears throat> that was uh, run and finished. We come back and they were, pick, they were then going to pick the 2002 World Cup squad because that was early in the year. Um, squad of 24 or something. And I remember just out of the blue, Rob Hammond and I were out on the pitch just having a hit in Perth. Let's go for a hit. All right, we'll go for a hit. Just, you know, as what, what do you do when you're 21 and been playing hockey all year, you go and play some more. Um, 
So, so we were out on the pitch and then out of the blue, Barry Dancer just walked down the stairs and out on the pitch out to us. And I thought he was just coming to say hello. And he told both of us on the pitch that we'd been selected in the squad. And so in that moment where I was probably thinking for the weeks leading in, oh, are we going to, am I going to go home? What, what am I going to do? Mm. Like I'll probably just, and I sort of probably knew that there was a, an announcement of a squad coming, but I probably didn't think that I had a chance of making it. Next minute he come down onto the pitch and, and told us that we were in. And I was just like, Oh, well, it looks, it looks like I'm staying. And so, yeah, you, you can imagine I was, I was pretty chuffed. Um, and then joined the squad. I come home, I think maybe for Christmas went back and trained and, and, I didn't didn't get selected, but that was my first taste of um, first taste of being around the senior program, and it wasn't long after that, in a in the middle of the year or sort of Mayish or something like that, that I made my debut um, in two thousand two against uh, South Korea. I right, read and and you scored you scored <laughs> two. It was a really good story about a really good story about this game. I'm not <laughs> sure if I've told you or you've heard it, but anyway. So it's my debut game. Actually, no. Well, I missed the first game. It was that happens because, sometimes. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I, I, I was, I was. I think we played India, and so I'm prepping, going, "Oh, you beauty, like it's on, it's on." Mm. Into the team meeting, Barry walks up to me and says, "Oh, Egg, you're sitting this one out." It was like this big deflation. <laughs> this, all, all the helium just went out of me, and I was just like, <laughs> "Oh well." So I was got to prep. I was got to prep as if I'm playing, and anyway, so I had to wait till the next day. And I was playing career and all right. And so we got a short corner and uh, I think, I think Paul Godoy may have flicked it and it just landed. I was pushing out and it landed just near me and I managed to slap it in. And that was the first goal of the game. So I was like, you beauty, like how, how good is this? Like you've scored in your opening game for Australia. You've actually been able to, to knock a goal in. <clears throat> Fast forward to the second half and I'll just give you some background. At the time, Korea, South Korea had this, occasionally they would in protest sometimes not play. Mm. So they would protest a decision and, and sort of go, well, no, we don't believe this is right. And the coach might have been giving them some instructions or whatever. I don't know how it all worked. But there must have been a, a decision they didn't agree with. Anyway, we're going, moving the ball down the field and all of a sudden a couple of them had just stopped playing. And the ball sort of ended up with me. And umpire went, <laughs> umpire went stop, 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 stop. And I went, oh, what's going on here? And they, so they took the ball back. There's a bit of a discussion. And anyway, Colin Batch, he was the assistant coach at the time. He was in the stands. It was in Adelaide. And I heard him yell out. He goes, Eggy. And I turned around and in no uncertain terms said, next time that happens, you hit the ball in the goal. <laughs> Maybe with a few explanatory words around it. And so here I am, first game going like, yes, sir. Yes, sir. If that ball comes to me, I'm hitting it in. <laughs> Not thinking that it's going to happen. I'm thinking that whatever's happening in the middle of the field with the umpires and, and the rest of the sort of senior players has been resolved. All right, we'll take a free hit and start again. No, they all stand dead still. Like, I mean, like, ball goes past and they sort of just watch you like that. And I go, so the ball ends up to me. I got it. The key, I literally walked it past the goalie and pushed it into the goal. And, and umpire blew a goal. Uh. And so I'm thinking, great, but this is where the bit that I didn't like. So Matthew Wells come running up from fullback. Like, I mean, running like mm. we had just won the Olympics. Mm. Yes! Like, like trying to make a point to them, like, yeah. And I think as I'm running back, he's going, yeah. And I'm, I'm thinking, get away from me. <laughs> just let me get back to the halfway line and let's just start this game because this feels really <laughs> awkward that I've just scored this goal where we just passed it through like a set of markers and I just happened just to knock it into the goal. Ridiculous. And so game, game over and I've, I've managed to have two goals against me name, albeit <laughs> one of them in very um, controversial circumstances. That's but, yeah, brilliant. So what happened after that? Did they, did they, like, did they resume playing or no? Nah? That was, that was so I think I, from what I, from what I remember, I think, I think there was a bit of a discussion. Coach called them off said, no, get back on and play. Oh, I think that was what I ended up playing out the match. Um, but, yeah, well, that, that, that happened a few times around the world mm. where they, where they did, did certain things like that. And, yeah, under Batchy's strict instructions, I, uh, I pushed the ball on the goal. <laughs> so I didn't want to get in trouble. <laughs> Here I am, 20, 21 years old, getting like told what to do. I said, I'm going to push it in. Well, I'll push it in. That's and then it's on the record. Sure enough, I've got a goal. So 
<laughs> that is hilarious. I'd love to see some footage of that because that is brilliant. Yeah, no. um, I just want to go back to uh, when Barry Dancer told you and Rob. I mean, that's that's a pretty opportunistic um, selection chat. Both of you just happened yeah. to be, and he would have just walked down from his office up at Perth Hockey yeah. Stadium, wouldn't he? So for, and I think that's. I think he's just he just walked down and in, in Barry's very calm way, just said, "Oh, just just letting you guys know that." Um, selections have been made. I think this is how it went for the for the uh, World Cup squad. And congratulations, you've both been selected. <laughs> and then uh, he's gone, and me and Rob are probably just looking at each other. And you beauty, um, which <laughs> which awesome. I think at the time, which I think at the time, um, it put a bit of an end, I think, in that period to us playing inline hockey. So we used to go down in the summer, mm. and as you a lot of people in Perth know, along Cottesloe there at North Northcott. The little cement pad that's above the the surf life saving storeroom in between, what is it the Blue Duck? Is it the Blue Duck? Is it still mm. there? The restaurant? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at yeah, the water yeah, on the right. So. so that little period, we used to play inline hockey there after work. Um, what we'd go down blades? there and just yeah. So inline like ice hockey sticks on yeah, rollerblades yeah. with, with two milk crates at the end, two on two. Like and Mighty Duck style. That's hilarious. Yeah, and at, at the time, like I'd never skated in my life. Like, <laughs> like, 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 never skated. And of course, Rob Hammond, like, because Rob's good at anything that he does with that type of stuff. He's skating backwards. He looks like he could go to the Winter Olympics for figure skating. He's just rolling around. They're all rolling around. I'm trying not to break my ankles. I'm trying not to break my wrists. Anyway, I managed to get to a point where I could sort of semi skate backwards, but hold my own going forwards. Mm. And the games used to get really brutal. Yeah. Like, like two on two. And, and because of those days, I mean, sorry, in that sport, because you can check people with your stick. Yeah, so yeah, as you yeah, go yeah. to get the ball, you're just not going to... Because we played it so much, you start to go back to hockey training, you just start knocking people's sticks <laughs> out of the way. Like, robotically, because... And you go, oh, shit, sorry, you're not allowed to do that. <laughs> because that's, you get so used to play, That's a veteran move, though. That's a veteran yeah. stick obstruction. I mean, like, yeah. Jamie Dwyer, was a, he was great yeah. for it when he, was, when he was nearly done. I remember trying to tackle him, but... I'm, so I'm still, up. I'm still plenty of senior, senior Div One players around the country are still getting the youngsters with that move. Gosh, it's a brilliant that, move. That, that, so that will be alive forever. Who are the four? So, well, it used to be a group of us. There was um, a couple of guys who played um, inline hockey, the Ballantyne brothers, and they worked for uh, Griffin and, and and that through the years. Um, and that, they were really good. Mm. Then there was Peter Hazelhurst, who found like one of the founders of Griffin, Jonathan Pedersen from Griffin. They all played this inline hockey in the summer just for a bit of fun so mm. we just went down there from from work at griffin and then um got thrown a pair of skates and said here we go we're on and then it would just be the thing to do in the summer because it was so hot in the summer months and the sun wouldn't go down for, uh, for hours mm. and what what a perfect setting on a beautiful summer's arvo you've got the sun coming down on the water the obh is right there you got yeah it was it was a really really fun fun way to, to get through the summer months albeit a little bit dangerous um, <laughs> but yeah one, I think what once once those sort of squads and things were named and trainings were on we sort of had to sort of pull a pin on that which is which is a bit unfair did you ever ever brush off the skates again and have a crack while you after your debut no, uh, I think I may have like just intermediately but gosh it, I think it stopped pretty pretty quickly, sort of mid 2000s. Mm. I don't think I did it again. Oh, it'd be interesting to see what happens if I jumped on a pair of rollerblades now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't reckon it would end well. Like I'm not even that good riding a bike. I used to, I used to, I used to run into like stationary objects just on my push bike. So <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm, I should probably never have been allowed to get on a set of rollerblades. <laughs> That's brilliant. Um, we're going to fast forward a couple of years to Athens. Um, yep. We got to talk about that. It was the 16th anniversary a few months ago of your your gold medal. Um, spoke yep. to Mick McCann. Geez, it would have been a couple of months ago now about his experience with the Athens Games. But I want to hear about your experience with the games, and also perhaps your take on the Mick McCann story about um, like about attacking Johnny. No, it, it, about oh, no. Attack, no, about attacking the um, the Spanish the team. Table? Yeah, 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 yeah. And surely, yeah. like that doesn't happen in a vortex. Surely there would have been other occasions. Will you be thinking about that or is that? Yeah, well, I'll just go back. I'll start with your like original question yeah. about my take of the Olympics. Like, like it's everyone's dream. If you're, in a, if you're in a sport that you are in a position to go to the Olympics, doesn't matter what it is, but if it's an Olympic sport, you want to 
get to the position where you can call yourself an Olympian. I mean, mm. that's, that's a pretty prestige um, title just to have on its own. Whether you medal or not, to get an opportunity to go is, is <clears> pretty rare. <clears throat> and you need a lot of things to go right to, to get to that point in whatever it is your, your chosen, um, chosen career and sport. But, you know, I went with, with probably a whole bunch of feelings that most of the other players would have been feeling as well, like some anxiety, some excitement, a bit of nerves, you know. But we were, we were such a young team. And I look back at, and I look at Olympic Games and you can argue sometimes you need some experience to hold up. And yes, that's very true. Like you need people that know how to, to handle the situation. But we had a group that were just, you know, not fearless, but really ambitious. And we had a couple of guys who'd been through the Sydney disappointment um, and we were able to draw on that through, through those periods leading into, the, into Athens. But we didn't go in rank number one. And so there, there was this optimism that potentially we knew we could compete, I guess, with, with, the, um, with the top teams. But we were young and, I think, ambitious. I think Mark Hickman, one of the goalkeepers, was our, was our oldest player at 29. And so if you, if, you, if you draw the line from there to our youngest player, who was Mark Knowles at the time, who was pretty, pretty raw and young... If you drew an average age between the 29th and the youngest, like it's a pretty young squad. Mm. Um, um, and so we had youth on our side and, and enthusiasm, but would that hold up in the, the highest um, possible level of um, competition? Like we can say yeah, now that it did, but at the time you go, well, you just don't know. I think that, that the, the external pressure that comes with the Olympic Games around hockey is it's media driven. Like, yes, there's expectations on the inside of the program and you know what the inside programs and the standards and the beliefs that you can have now because you've been there as a player in, in certain events. But the media fire that comes with the Olympic Games around, oh, yeah, hockey will medal, you know, or oh, yeah, we, can, we, can, we can ink that one in sort of thing. Like, that's, that's a tag that, that is unfairly placed, I think, on the sport. But it comes with being successful. So if mm. you continually medal, then they expect you to medal. And so we went to Athens and like I never got to play any national competition under any other coach than Barry Dancer. But I think when I look back and I I think about how much planning and and just how well structured everything was, that wasn't an accident. You know, he was so meticulous in having – a game plan for everyone. He had so much information about the teams that we were going to play at the Olympics that when we went to over to the Olympics, we had a game plan in the can ready to pull out for each opposition that was probably 98% ready. And it was just maybe personnel driven um, for each match that would, that would change that. But the rest was, was just drilled. We knew, okay, India do this, Argentina do that, Holland do this. And it was just pulled out. There's the blueprint. Let's put it into play. Um, and so we, we were, I think we were so lucky to have a coach like Barry, an assistant like Colin Batch, who in his own right was probably a head coach back then anyway, just in waiting. And he's now, the rest is history, what he's been able to do as a head coach. But gosh, we were spoiled with the, with the brains that we had. Not just him, with Larry Mack. Was, Larry McIntosh was there. Even Jeremy Davey, who was heading up um, the the analysis side of things was a brilliant hockey brain in his own right, and so we had a smorgasbord of of you know knowledge plus some pretty decent players um, that that got us to a position where we could be competitive. Mm. And so you know you go out there, you throw caution to the wind, and the the rest is history it's an easy thing to say but it it doesn't come without some luck Mm. and i tell this story often to people that i remember mark stokes our physio head physio telling us that when it was all over in almost a month of time in athens we went into the village we were there very early then we went out of the village for a couple of days went to crete one of the islands just to get away then come back in final prep and it started so it was the best part of a month that we were there 
He said the worst injury that he had to treat for our group was Neil McLean's sprained thumb trying to catch a football on maybe the first <laughs> or second day we're in the village. Um, and so, and that's, that's not a player. That's a psychologist as well. That's our psychologist. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. That, Neil McLean is our psychologist. And so, um, and which is a bit, it's just a bit crazy when it, considering he's done a lot of work with AFL football teams that know. He wouldn't know how to, wouldn't know how to catch football, but, but he tell, yeah, Mark Stokes tells that story that the, the worst injury and people say you need a lot of, you need some luck to win Olympics and that's true, but people probably think oh, I need some luck. Like I just think about luck in the games, mm. but to have a healthy roster, mm. just, just, just niggle management was probably the worst he had to do. Mm. And this is, this is, this is in the era where you had two goalkeepers on your list and only 14 field players yeah. and some key personnel some of our, but like our key personnel at the time, playing seventy minutes in the heat of Athens, it's an incredible effort. When you you think about five pool games and two crossovers, a semi and a final, to get through that with a sprained thumb from your psychologist being your worst injury, <laughs> and then maybe maybe Dean Butler got he got split open sort of right on half time in the final and had to be stitched up and and that and and that was just a game maintenance thing that happens it happens in the battle, but no injuries where you go, oh my god, we might lose this guy for the mm. for the for the tournament or a couple of games or whatever. It was, you know, that that is the luck you need to win these types of things. It's incredible. With um yeah. with that final final corner, um, you talk about a pressure situation and and for those of you who don't know, Eggy was the one who ejected the ball for that <coughs> fateful corner where Jamie slotted it. You've done some work with me with my push out early when when I moved yeah. over to Perth. You were one of the assistant coaches and we'll get into that later. But I mean, people, and this might sound like a slight of injector, but people forget how much pressure there is down on that on that baseline when you have to, because there's yeah. no excuses. I mean, you've done that thousands of times. There's yeah. absolutely no excuses. And you're the only person who, in that instance, yeah. can determine whether you win yeah. a gold medal or, or not. Can you remember that moment? Yeah. yeah. So I happened to be on because <laughs> at the time... Michael Brennan and Troy Elder were the starting inside forwards and I, I was coming off the bench the majority of the Olympics. Um, but something must have happened in that extra time that I'd gone into the game for, for Michael. Um, and so I happened to be on the ground. And then all of a sudden we get the corner and the call um, come out, whatever. And we were heading back to the line to push it out. And you're right that it's a closed skill. You know, it's a closed skill. It's not an open skill. It's something that is closed in terms of nothing can affect me other than potentially what's going on in my head. Mm. Um, and, and I'll be lying if I said, Jesus Christ, do, do not do not push this crooked, you know. I'm probably, <laughs> had, I'm probably having those thoughts as I'm, um, as I'm walking back to the line. So, but, but a closed skill that is done thousands and thousands of times, you, you can just hopefully put it into a position where you rely on your technique and that, you know, you can push it out. And in the end it went dead straight and went dead mm. flat. So, um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's one of those things that if you miss that push, that what happens with that result, if that's slightly crooked or doesn't go to where it needs or bubbles and bounces up off, off the stick or something like that period's over and you've got to go again. Fine margins. And so, and so, yeah. But th that game itself had had some had some twists that some people, a lot of people, don't realise that if you watch the game carefully. And for those that followed hockey back then, like Turn De Neuer was the best player internationally. And this is my opinion. Like we mm. we had we've got some rippers, and I can probably go into my favourite players and things like that later. But like Turn De Neuer was in my opinion, the best hockey player of my time. Like he had, he was just, and turned an eyes from Holland from those that, that, that don't know. He's, he was incredibly fast, but he was, he was three plays ahead of everyone. He was one of those guys that just could just read the game. <clears throat> so, so incredibly like, well, that he was already out thinking you. <clears throat> and fortunately, in my time over my career, a lot of time I played right midfield, right inside, he played left. And so I had a front row seat to the, to the best player in the world. So I got, I got to see him as close as you can possibly be, also tasked with trying to stop him. <laughs> and so, and I remember this, I remember <laughs> whenever we play Holland, 
in Barry's slideshows, DN in capitals was Denoya. And so mm. there was always things that were related to DN. <laughs> and it was always about stopping DN's run because he was so clever in, in carrying the ball at you at ridiculously fast speeds. And he'd n- knock the ball past you knowing full well he's going to get it back in a different area. And so it was mm. trying to deny his run. And so I remember the last pool game we played before we crossed over to Spain. We ended up losing that game 2-1. And so I went out there. So I started that game. I was charged with, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut this guy down. And I remember at halftime, Barry made a point. He said, oh, Eggy's de- he's, he's denying Denoyer off the ball is incredible, blah, blah. And in my head, I'm thinking, I don't think I've touched the ball. <laughs> because all I had this sole focus on, I'm stopping this bloke. Mm. And so, so as he would run past me, I would sort of know where the ball is and I would just block him. Like... Mm legally but just try and run him off the ball and in my head i'm thinking i'm doing my job and when he said that at half time i started to think to myself have i even touched the ball when we've when we've got the ball <laughs> am, am i literally just playing this role and i i'd have to go back on the table and actually say i probably i would have touched it but in my mind i'm thinking all i'm doing is this yeah. all i'm doing is stopping this guy but fast forward to the final half to half time he doesn't come back on the field hmm because he injures himself and mm. you take the world's best player out of an Olympic final. That's again, if you, if you want to say you need a bit of luck, well, we, we'll take that because mm. no longer did we have to worry about this guy that could change a game. You know, he had that ability. He was, he was, he was not unbeatable, but he was a guy that you go, okay, this game's in the balance. And as you saw the game pan out, it was in the balance mm. and without him on the ground, you had this, I guess leg up to go. Well, we don't have we don't have that we don't have that factor anymore, and so that that whether it changed the game completely, but it would have made some sort of difference to their ability to to play. I yeah, think. yeah, yeah. Brilliant. So add that to add, add that to the luck list. Yep, certainly will. Um, back to back to Mick McCann's story. Um, yep. Is that is that symptomatic of of him? Was was the Australian team known as a, a bit of a bruising team, like a bit of no. attitude, or what was the? I don't think so. But there, there was this. There was this. I think sort of just looming rivalry between Spain and Australia, and mm. and maybe a little bit of it's probably mutual respect there. But Spain were they had a group of together that were pretty decent. You know, they had. They had a pretty potent front three. I think Ed Tabau, Sandy Fraser. They had, and who was the other one? Um, Polomat. One more. Yeah, Polomat. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so they had these three guys that could run, run like hares, and hit the ball in the goal. And they were just so dynamite. Then they had this these calming guys about. They had um, Garcia and a couple of others. They had a group that could be competitive, and so they probably had belief that they could. They could go all the way. And so there was this little bit of rivalry, I think, um, sort of building. And so how it happened was, as you know, you go into events, you have training time slots. We roll in, Spain are on before us. And we're waiting for them to get off. We've done our warm-ups. Okay, they're still practicing something. And I didn't see it happen. I only heard the commotion. (laughs) But next minute I look around and mix in an argument with a goalkeeper and a couple other Spaniards and then from the uh the stories that come after from the people who saw it he's had enough and he's just he's just walked down and walloped this ball at this goalkeeper <laughs> and in my head i'm thinking jesus christ <laughs> like wh- what are you doing <laughs> and but it's it's not um it's not mick mccann being a bully but you know he's a passionate guy mm. and, and mm. he he embodied he embodied everything that was a kookaburra you know mm. if there's someone that that lived and breathed and set standards about what we were, you know, he, it was, he was right up there with, with one of those guys and he was just rightfully taking what was his. And that was our pitch time, I think. And then that set up, that set up a beautiful, um, beautiful uh, crossover semifinal pretty mm-hmm. much that we crossed over and played them in that semi and gave them a bit of a beating, um, which, um, put us in that position to win, but yeah, that's a that's a pretty incredible story. But they got us back. Did he? Did I'm not sure. Did he tell you the story about the fire hydrant? <laughs> he didn't tell me about the fire. Hydrant. So 
<laughs> post Olympics, we're in the we're in the um, in our apartment second or third day after or something, and it was at the time when okay, we're going to do the signing session. You know, you know the signing session. So you get all your gear out and you put them all around the tables, and people go around and sign all your your shirts and stuff that you want to take away for memorabilia or whatnot. So they were all they were all positioned out around the around the uh, apartment. Anyways, I think. I think we'll throw water bombs off the balcony at people. And in the I village. don't know whether it was... Wa- yeah. Yeah. And so in the, in the Olympic village. And I don't know if it was a water bomb or an entire plastic bag of water. I cannot remember. <laughs> but anyway, one got hurled down and it happened to be the Spanish second goalkeeper or something. Anyway, as soon as it hits, he stops and heads for the apartment. Like coming this is up after. This is this is after the. This is, this, this, is po- this is po- Yeah. This, so this is post Olympics. So we've won. So we're <laughs> we're in there having a good time, enjoying village life, whatever. Yeah. And he starts heading for the apartment, <laughs> and all of us are like, "Oh my god, what's he doing? He's coming up. What do we do? What do we do? What do we do?" Anyway, we didn't run. We didn't realize that on his way up, he's grabbed a fire hydrant off the wall, <laughs> and as he's walked in, as he's come up. He's opened the door and then he's just let this thing go. And I meant emptied it. Like, and we're all going, oh my God. And then as he goes, we're all trying to chase him. As he leaves, he's, li- he's doing it above him. So you can't see him. <laughs> then it empties and then he's off. And everyone goes, yeah, well played, mate. Well played. Bit of a laugh. Anyway, we walk back in. The entire room is filled with this lime yellowish dust all over everyone's memorabilia to be signed. Jeez. Like, I mean, it was covered in it. That's unbelievable. And so, so in, in, our, in our minds, yeah, we had a bit of a laugh, but in his mind, he's sitting in Spain thinking, I had the last laugh. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you can hit a ball at us. How's your fire hydrant going? <laughs> well, that's it for part A. See you soon for part B of the Help Side with Nathan Eglinton. <laughs>